Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Pollinator Special. Um, today, uh, joining me is Carl, who is going to talk to us about um, native pollinators here in Ohio. Pollinator Week was established about 13 years ago by a group called the, the Pollinator Partnership. And so they initiated this um, week and they made sure that it happened when the U.S. Senate unanimously voted to vote this week as National Pollinator Week. So Carl, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of how you have got um, involved with working with pollinators and working with honeybees? Sure. I started a long time ago, back when I was about 16 years old. I got interested in honeybees while visiting Penn State. I uh, was in their Natural History Museum, saw an observation beehive, and really got fascinated with them. And went home and got myself two beehives and started raising honeybees at 16. Did that for a while, had an uh, internship for a while at Penn State working on their honeybees with Dr. Alan Benton, who was a leading specialist at the time in honeybees. But then, you know, college and marriage and things moved on, and after a while, I kind of got out of it. And I want to say about 10 years ago, my wonderful wife for Christmas bought me a gift card for Dedant, which is a honeybee supply house, and I got back into honeybees about 10 years ago. And at that time, I have a degree in biology and wildlife biology, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about bees and bees in general, and that's when I really kind of got hooked on native bees and the importance of native bees and how much, I mean, I mean they're really fascinating. Uh, not that honeybees aren't, but the native bees really got my interest, and I really took off and started trying to learn more about the native bees you know, here in Ohio and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you got involved at Stratford Ecological Center? Well, I uh, retired in 2016 and I was looking for something to do in the natural sciences and getting back into nature. So I took the OCVN class, which is the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program that OSU runs and operates. Uh, so I did that and one of the young ladies in the class actually worked at Stratford. And she said, you know, you really should stop by Stratford and see if you like the place and maybe you'd want to volunteer there. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Mm -hmm. I help out with the messages program that they have and now trying to help out a little bit with the apiary that they have and trying to get more native bees into the program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds awesome. And I'm really glad that you could be here today and do this talk uh, for everyone. Um, so today, Carl is actually going to walk us through a, like a PowerPoint presentation and talk to us a lot about um, different native pollinators and things like that. Um, because a lot of times when we think about pollinators, we only think about honeybees. Um, so it is important to also realize and recognize the importance of other native pollinators as well. So I'm excited especially to learn more about it, and I hope you all are excited to learn more about it. Um, if you haven't yet, please go ahead and like this video, subscribe to our channel, if you haven't, um, down below in our description, you can find a link to Stratford Ecological Center. You can find a link to donate to Stratford if you're um, interested and able to. And then further down um, in the description as well, you can find a link to um, the Pollinator Partnership to learn a little bit more about how this week got started um, and kind of the importance of native pollinators, um, you know, apart from this video. So. I'm going to go ahead and show you the schedule for our Beginner Farmers program, which we've been going and doing every Thursday uh, throughout this summer. Um, and then once we're done with that schedule, we are going to jump right into the presentation. All right. you can make that. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, well, thank you, Olivia, for that. Uh, let's jump right in on the native bees. 
Uh, first off, I think what we need to do is talk a little bit about what is a bee. If you look at the top left-hand corner there, you, you see a hoverfly. There's a lot of those right now out on the flowers, you know, on a warm sunny day. You'll see those all over the place. And people were always scared to death of those things because they think it's going to sting them. But it's actually only a fly. If you look at the head, it's got real big eyes. If you look at the wings, there's only one wing on each side. There's, they're not furry. So that's kind of one of the ways you can tell that it's, uh, it's not a bee, but it's actually a fly. If you go to the top right-hand corner, that's a bumblebee. That is one of our important native pollinators. And you can tell it's a bee because it's fuzzy. That's the first thing. It's a female bee because you can see that it has, she has pollen on her legs. So she's been collecting pollen and nectar for her nest. Uh, so that is definitely one of our very important native bees. Down on the bottom left-hand corner, that's one of our favorites, a yellow jacket. You can see that it has no fur on it. It doesn't have any way of storing any kind of pollen, and that's because yellow jackets are primarily predators, and they get their protein through eating other bees, other bugs, things like that. So they are not a bee. They are not considered a bee. Um, then in the bottom right-hand corner, hopefully everybody at Stratford knows what that is, because right now we're raising about Oh, 1.2 million of them over at the, the farm in Stratford. That is one of our honeybees. And again, it's a female. You can tell because she's got the pollen on her legs and it's very fuzzy. So again, that's one of the primary ways you can tell a uh, bee from other things is because they are so furry and they have four wings instead of only two. So bees, you know, they've been around for a long time. About 130 million years ago, uh, the flowers started to develop and started to come out uh, you know, through evolution. We had flowers, but those flowers were asexual. They didn't have any pollen or nectar or any, any of those things. So really didn't need bees at the time to actually cross pollinate anything. So it wasn't until about 100 million years ago that bees actually came on the scene and flowers and bees have been co-evolving ever since. Uh, the bees came from the wasp family, the ants, uh, that, that whole order of insects. And they really went from becoming predators to becoming vegans. So they only eat nectar, they only eat pollen, that's the only two things from plants. Currently worldwide we think there's about 20,000 different species of bees in the world. Um, we say approximately because every time a scientist does another survey, they always find new species of bees. Uh, so, you know, that whole, that number keeps increasing as time goes on. In North America, we have 4,000 different species of bees, uh, which is about four times the number of uh, different species of birds that we have, six times for butterflies, and ten times the number of mammals. So what that means is there's a lot of bees out there. And a lot of people don't notice the bees. So, you know, you might want to keep your eyes open the next time you're walking through a field, but there's a lot of them out there. Here in Ohio, we have about 400 species. Again, I say about because there has not been a real good survey done of how many bees we actually have in the state of Ohio. Currently, OSU this year has started a program where we're putting together a native bee atlas for the state of Ohio. Uh, that's just started. It's a citizen science project, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But hopefully from that, we'll get a better idea of what we actually have in the state so that we can help to preserve it. <clears throat> so about 70% of the bees, the native bees that are out there live in the ground. They're ground dwelling bees. They make tunnels and live under sheds and in people's stone walls and in people's houses. Uh, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of the bees are, 30% of them are cavity dwellers. Uh, so that's going to be important to know as we move on here. And one thing that a lot of folks don't, uh, don't know is that not all bees stink. Only the female bee stinks. The male bees, you can pick them up and pet them all day long and they're not going to hurt you. Uh, it's the females that actually will give you the sting. Are the bees in decline? That's a, that's a question I get quite a bit. And again, the answer is if you talk to the scientists, 
you know, all over the country at OSU and other places and ask them that question, they'll say, we think so. It certainly would appear so. But again, there's really not a lot of good hard evidence to actually back that up. But with all the decline we have in habitat and our biodiversity being depleted here in the state of Ohio and around the country, it is probably very likely that a lot of our bees are in decline. We really don't know a lot. Since after World War II, between the 60s and 70s, we started getting more interested in insects and bugs. A lot of that, I think, came from the DDT and Rachel Carlson and the work that she did to get us a little, little more in tune with what we're actually doing to our environment. So after the 70s, more people started, more scientists started looking at the native bees around the country and around the world. So we're, we're getting more information on them as we go. And of course, colony collapse disorder, which happened in 2006, made the headlines. And a lot of people all of a sudden got really interested in pollinators and pollination. So uh, that's, you know, that, that helped a lot in terms of getting people interested in bees. Um, we do have, in 2017, the first endangered bee in uh, continental United States. I say continental because Hawaii already had a couple of them. But the rusty patch bumblebee, which was a bee that was all over the state of Ohio, if you saw a bumblebee, the chances were you, it was probably a rusty patch. That is now no longer in the state of Ohio. It's been completely gone. And the only place there's any left is up in the state of Michigan and a little bit in Michigan and in Minnesota. So that is our first endangered species. So from all that, you can probably deduce that, yeah, we really do think that native bees are in decline and, and probably in trouble. So why should we care? Well, of course, pollination. You can see here a picture of, you know, a tomato plant and how the flower turns into the tomato and it doesn't happen unless the bees actually pollinate those flowers, so that becomes very important. About 25 to 30 percent of the food we eat depends on pollination. A lot of plants, a lot of food that we eat is wind pollinated or pollinated by other means, um, like wheat, rice, corn, that's all wind pollinated. It doesn't have anything to do with bees or pollination, so that, that we don't have to worry about. But a lot of the food that we do eat, where we get a lot of our nutrients and our variety in our food supply, those plants have to be pollinated or we, or we won't have that food. So pollination is very important. There are a lot of pollinators out there. You got butterflies, you got birds, you got bats, you got bugs, and of course the flies that we see out there today, all of them are fantastic pollinators, they help. But they are in the world of, in the world of pollination considered secondary pollinators. The reason being, they don't need the pollen. They're not on those flowers for the pollen, they're on there for the nectar. And the pollen is kind of just stuck to them in a half a stance way and they just luckily pollinate other flowers. So it's, it's not a primary thing that they do. The real primary pollinators are the bees. And they are considered a keystone species, meaning that if the bees go away, a lot of the ecosystems that we have currently and a lot of the biodiversity that we have on the, on, in Ohio and around the world is going to be decreased and go away if we don't have those bees. They are really built for pollinating. They're, they have uh, on their bodies, they're very furry, like I said, and that fur that they have or the hairs that they have are like a bad case of the frizzies. You know, they're all branched and very, they, they build up a lot of static as they fly. So it, it's kind of interesting to watch as a bee, there's YouTube videos out there of a bee getting close to a flower and you can actually see the pollen jumping off of the flower and onto the bee just because of that static charge that they build up. So bees are really built for pollination and that's why they're considered a primary pollinator. Carpenter bees, just to talk about a few of the common bees that we're going to see out there uh, while we're wandering around out in our fields. A carpenter bee, which everybody knows and loves, is not a bumblebee. Uh, it is a different genus all on its own. The way you can tell it's a carpenter bee from a bumblebee is because it's got a shiny uh, abdomen or a shiny hiney. Uh, these bees do, can do a lot of damage to wooden structures. So if you have something that's not painted, if you have a, a bench or if you have a gazebo or a deck, 
You can see these little half inch holes that are all over it that bees are coming and going. Well, the half inch hole is not telling the whole story. If you actually cut that board in half, like you see there, you will see that those bees are tunneling all through that wood. And eventually that structure is gonna be compromised and, and can cause you a lot of problems. So, but they are fantastic pollinators. They come out, they're one of the earliest bees that come out in the spring. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be hard pressed to be without them. Another one is the bumblebee, which I said was one of our most important pollinators globally. Uh, in Ohio, we have, we think about 16 species of bumblebees with the Eastern bumblebee being the most common. That's the one you see most often when you're walking around. Uh, they do live in a the ground. They have an interesting life cycle. They are the only native bee that we have in the United States that is a solitary or is a, uh, a, a social bee, you social they call it. And that is because they build nests that have workers, they have a queen, they divide up the labor. Uh, so they are social insects. So uh, kind of the life cycle of it is they stay, the queens will be in the ground over winter. They'll hibernate in a hibernate. Hibernium, it's called. Uh, when they come out in the fall, when it's about 50 degrees or so, they're going to go find a place to live. And usually it's a rodent nest or under a deck or somewhere where they can be out of the, out of the weather. Uh, they're going to put, they're going to create little wax cells, not quite like honeybees, but these are little cups of wax. And in there, she's going to put nectar that she's collected from the flowers in the spring. She's also going to collect pollen. And then she's going to create a pollen ball, and on that she's going to lay her eggs, and she's going to keep them warm by buzzing. And she'll keep that nest and those eggs about 90 degrees throughout the spring until they hatch. And she uses the nectar in the little cup as food to keep her going so she doesn't have to leave the eggs to go out and uh, you know forage for more nectar or pollen. Once those eggs hatch out, that's the worker bees. And about two weeks ago, I think I saw my first worker bumblebee, and you can tell because they're really small. They're a lot smaller than what you would think a bumblebee would be. So they're the workers. They're the ones that are gonna take over creating those little wax cups and getting the pollen and the nectar. And all the queen's gonna be doing at that point is uh, laying the eggs. About July, she's gonna be starting to lay unfertilized eggs. One of the things about bees is you have males and females. The female is a fertilized egg. That's where they come from. Males are gener generated from unfertilized eggs. So she'll start laying a bunch of unfertilized eggs and create some males. Once they hatch out, they'll go out and fly around and wait for the females to come. She'll then lay some more eggs that are fertilized to create females. And the worker bees will feed those females something called royal jelly, which is a mixture of enzymes and hormones that actually turn those work that those eggs and those larvae into uh, queen bees. The queens will fly out, mate with the males, and then they'll feed and for the rest of the fall until they build up their fat body so they can survive the winter. And they'll build their little herbiculum again and go down in the ground and then come back out in the spring to start all over again. So really fascinating. What makes them really important to us in terms of pollination is they do something called buzz pollination. Uh, and what they'll do, I don't know if you saw that tomato flower that was there, you really don't see the stamen and the pistils that are out there that contain the pollen. They're kind of hidden inside the flower. And it's very hard for other bees to go in there and get that pollen out to be able to use it or to pollinate the other tomato plants. What the bumblebee will do is she will fly up to that and she will hug that flower. And she will take her wing muscles and she will disconnect the wings from the muscles and she'll buzz real hard. And that buzzing will make that pollen come out of that flower and fly all over the place. And that's how she gets the pollen out of those flowers and on her body so that she can scrape them off and take them back to her hive for her babies. Very, very important for, for us, that buzz pollination, because there are roughly 65 different families of plants that require that. Those include tomatoes and blueberries and cranberries and potatoes and a whole bunch of other yummy vegetables that we like and, and things that we like to eat that require buzz pollination. So very important. 
Honeybees can't do that. Most, no other bees really can do the buzz pollination as well as the, as the bumblebee. Uh, another bee that's real common is a mason or is a mining bee. It's called the group. The genius is called Andrina. They come out also in the early spring. And there's one species that we have here in Ohio that really likes spring beauties, the wildflowers. So if you're ever out in the springtime and when it's early and you see a patch of spring beauties, you might want to just keep an eye on those flowers and kind of focus on those flowers. And I will almost guarantee you, you will see mining bees flying all around those uh, flowers and getting their nectar and their pollen for their young. Those bees are ground nesting bees, so they're underneath the leaf litter in the forest and they drill down about a foot and have little tubes, little, little shafts that go off of that main one. And that's where they raise their young. So really interesting bees and Almost all of the bees have a way of storing pollen. Uh, the two you saw, the, the, the carpenter bee and the bumblebee, they store the pollen on their legs after they've collected it. This particular bee actually has hairy armpits. So if you see one with a lot of pollen, you'll see it up underneath those, up underneath those front legs is where they actually store the pollen. We also have sweat bees. A lot of those are out right now when it gets warmer in the summer. They're a little a bit later. They are also ground nesting bees and some of the most prettiest bees I think we have. Uh, keep your eye out for them. They're bright green in color. Uh, the one in the upper left there is a bicolored sweat bee. So, you know, super pretty. Uh, if, you get, if you can get a C1, they're really, really impressive. You also, as you're hiking along and sweating over these July hot days, sometimes you get these little bees that actually land on your arm or on your neck or somewhere else and they're trying to get the, the salt from your skin. So they're, they're also a little bee that's a tiny sweat bee. So mason bees are popular. A lot of folks that, that know anything about native bees probably know a little bit about mason bees. They are cavity nesting bees. They are commercially available. A lot of people like putting up the little bee hotels for them. Uh, which if you look at that tube that's in the picture down there, you can kind of see how they lay out that whole cavity once they start, um, you know, with, a, with building that nest. What they'll do is they'll take mud, and that's why they're called mason bees, and they will line that whole tube with mud. She will then take nectar and pollen and form a little ball called bee bread is what they call it, and she will deposit some of that at the very back of that tube. On that, she'll lay an egg, and then she'll back up a little bit. She'll put up a mason wall that is certain concave way a certain way, so the baby bee, when it comes out, knows which way's out, which I think is pretty ingenious. And she'll do, keep doing that. She'll do it six, seven times, depending on how long the cavity is. Um, you know, just putting the ball of, of pollen down, an egg, back up, put another partition, ball, you know, just, just keep on going. The first one that she's going to lay, the first eggs that she's going to lay, the first five or six or however many, is going to be fertilized eggs, meaning they're the females. The last eggs that she's going to lay, once she's starting to run out of tube space and she's getting close to the end, she's going to lay male eggs, which are not fertilized. The reason she does that is the males don't take as long to develop as the females. So they will come out first. They will be out there waiting for the females out on the flowers, just living it up and having a good old time while they're waiting for their, their lady friends to develop. And then the females won't have so many bodies to call, crawl over to get out of that tube to get, get out. So that's kind of how that, that whole system works. Uh, the other one is another important one for especially agriculture is the leaf cutter bee. Uh, it's a summer bee too. It's in July is when it usually uh, comes out. June, late June and July, right about now. Uh, they're kind of an interesting bee in that they're the only, one of the few bees that actually will pollinate alfalfa. And alfalfa is a critical farm product for dairy. Dairy cows need alfalfa and a lot of farmers like Jeff, he raises alfalfa on occasion for the cows. Uh, but if you want a seed crop from that alfalfa, you have to have the alfalfa pollinated. Alfalfa is not easy to pollinate. A lot of bees don't like it because when the bee lands on the flower, it automatically gets smacked in the head with the little 
body part of that flower that has the pollen on it. And it scares a lot of bees away. So alkid bees, leaf cutter bees are two that are very common that they don't seem to mind. They just take the whack on the head and get the nectar and the pollen and go about their business. So they're really important to the agricultural industry for that, for that very reason. They're kind of cool too in that they're cavity nesters as well. But instead of using uh, the mud like the mason bee does, what they'll use is little leaf parts. So if you go out in your garden and you see leaves that have little holes cut in them, little round holes, it's probably a leaf cutter bee that did that. And she will take those leaves back to the cavity. She will line the cavity with leaves. And then every little section that she's laying her eggs in are going to be little cocoons of leaves that are just bound together. So it's, it's kind of really cool. And in, in that bee, you can see in the picture, they collect the pollen on their abdomen. So you can see it's, it's a good way of telling when you have a leaf cutter bee versus uh, some of the other ones that are out there. So it's all about the pollen. Uh, a lot of bees are generalists, like honeybees and bumblebees. They're out for the entire season, so they need to be able to collect pollen and nectar from a wide variety of different plants. But like that mining bee, some bees are specialists, and they will only go to one type of flower. In that case with the mining bee, it was the spring beauties that were out. So. You know, we need to keep that in mind when we're putting in our pollinator gardens that we need a large variety of different plants so that these, all the different bees can appreciate what we're doing for them. So, uh, and for the bees, it's not so much about the nectar, it's about the pollen. Pollen is a complex thing. It's, it's, it's a lot of different proteins in there, a lot of amino acids, which the bees need to raise their young. All bees, all, all things in nature need protein to raise their young. So with the bees, where they get that from is the pollen. So it's very important that they have a good pollen source, and that's why some bees have specialized on one or two plants and haven't just you know, taken any pollen from any plant. So a lot of bees are specialists, but there's quite a few that are still, uh, you know, can, can take it from a lot of different plants. And that's... Over the last hundred million years, these plants and bees have co-evolved to be able to take care of themselves. And again, like I said, uh, the other thing about the bees is, you know, some of these bees are pretty tiny. They're not going to go real far for nectar and pollen. They can't fly that far. Honey bees can go three to five miles. Uh, a lot of times in a drought or in a, when they're really having a hard time finding resources, They've been clocked at going six to seven miles for nectar and pollen. These little guys aren't going to do that. They can't do that. They don't have the stamina. Bumblebees will go one or two miles, they've measured, but that's about it. And like I said, the little tiny ones, three, 50 to 300 feet. A study was done at OSU a while back, and I thought this was pretty interesting, where they took, they, they raised some bumblebees in the lab. And on one of the bumblebees, they put a radio transmitter they took that hive and they put it in a field out in right east of, right west of Columbus here, and they followed that bee. The first time the bee went out, which is the green line, <coughs> excuse me, the bee was all over the place. He was going all, she was going everywhere trying to find a good source of pollen and nectar for her. But then all of a sudden, if you look on the left with all that yellow, that, they're later flights, and she really honed in on something. Perhaps it was some trees that are in that wood line that were blooming at the time. You know, maybe a tulip poplar or one of the maples or something like that or an oak. And she really put a lot of time in going back and forth collecting, and poll collecting pollen and nectar from that source. But when it started to run out, the orangish lines, you can see she's a little lost again. She's looking again for something. And then the red is where she finally found another source which maybe is some goldenrod that's in that wood line that's right there. And that's where she honed in on and kept going back and forth. So it's kind of really cool to watch them, how once they find a source of nectar and pollen that's reliable, they'll just milk it and keep going back and forth until they can uh, get all the pollen and nectar that they need before they go and look for something else. So bees have a lot of challenges. 
there's a lot of, they have a lot of problems. Uh, one of them is habitat loss, of course. We're building roads and parking lots and houses and just taking up and fragmenting a lot of their habitat. But then when we do have habitat, we're really decreasing the amount of biodiversity that's in that habitat that the bees can use. And what that means then is they don't have the nutrition that they need to be able to raise their young and to be healthy. So that's a, that's a big problem we have right now with all of the insects that are out there and birds and all the native, all the, all the plants and animals that are out there. Pesticides, of course, we know all about that. It's not just about the insecticides that people are spraying and putting out, but other pesticides as well, like uh, fungicides and herbicides and, and that kind of thing. So they're, they all impact the bees and are really hurting them quite a bit. And we have no way, the other problem is we really have no way of protecting the wild pollinators. It's hard to study them. And like a beehive, the, the bees are all in a box. You can treat them for whatever disease they get. You can move them if you need to. You can do a lot of things to really keep the hive healthy. Whereas our native bees, we're, we don't know what's going on with them. So it's really hard to protect them and take care of them. Um, and the research, there's not, like I said, there's not a heck of a lot of research. And a lot of the money that's spent is spent on honeybees because it is an agricultural crop and it's a very important crop for, for North American agriculture. Uh, so, you know, just a lot of the money that's out there goes towards honeybees. The USDA has five bee research labs around the country. Uh, only two of them do anything with native bees, one in Utah and one in Bethesda, Maryland. And the one in Bethesda, Maryland has one of the country's top bee experts who works there, and he is relegated to a garage on the back lot, <laughs> which he doesn't mind. Uh, you know, he'll, he tells you that, you know, that's actually kind of nice because everybody lets him alone back there, but it is just kind of where the money goes that uh, is kind of important, I think, so. So what can we do? So this whole presentation up until now has been trying to teach you a little bit about the native bees and what they need and what they're up against. So let's talk a little bit about maybe what we can do to help them. One of the things, of course, is nesting. And we have you know, different types of nesting that we can do. Uh, something like this, which is in the picture, where you can open them up and see what the bees are doing. We also have the tubes that are out there that these work really well uh, to, for nests. One of the things you might want to keep in mind though when you're buying one of those bee hotels that you can get at, at Lowe's or Menards or those kind of places is that the tubes themselves have to be at least six or seven inches long because like I had said in the presentation, the female is going to start at the back and raise females and then she's going to put males at the very end. And you want, we have to have enough room in here for her to do that. So the ones you see at Menards are maybe half this length, and the tubes aren't long enough for really what the bees need. So you want to make sure that they're the right length. Also, if you have any woodlots or any dead trees, if they're not a safety problem with people, and you can keep those dead trees standing, a lot of native bees live in dead trees and the holes that are created by other insects that bore into those trees. Uh, so that's a, that's a big source too of, uh, you know, where the cavities can come from for these cavity nesting bees. But like I said, you know, 70% of the bees live in the ground and that's a lot harder. So for those folks, for those guys, what we need to do is we need to set aside places in our gardens where they can have open soil and where it's not all covered with mulch because mulch is not doing the bees any good. Also, if you have any rocks in your garden, boulders or, or different kinds of rock features, that's good for the native bees as well because what they like is they like those rocks to build a nest next to the rocks because the rocks will hold the heat and they don't have to heat their nesting cavities up as much. So that's a... so. If you are mulching, don't mulch close to the rocks. Keep some of the mulching, you know, away from some of the ground. The bees kind of like a south-facing, sloping, well-drained area. Uh, they also like sandy if the sand, if the soil is kind of loamy 
or sandy, that's easy for them to dig in. So they, they do like that. Uh, so, and there, I did put in the presentation a bumblebee house that's out on the web that you can try. But I will tell you the gentleman at uh, Bethesda, Maryland, Sam Drogi, who's, who's a friend of mine who, who does a lot with, like I said, he's the, one of the world's experts on native bees and getting bees and he struggles with this. I mean, most people try to do these things, but they don't work. I mean, but you can try and sometimes they do work. So I encourage it, but don't be disappointed if you, uh, all, you know, if you put these up and the bees don't come because you know, that's, uh, it's important not to disturb these bees once you find them. If you do, or if you are lucky enough to have a bumblebee nest in your yard, don't disturb it, leave it alone. A lot of the bumblebees, one of the cavities that they pick to build their nest in is bluebird boxes. So a lot of bluebird monitors uh, will open up a box and be unpleasantly surprised to see that there's a nest of uh, bumblebees in there. And it seems they really like chickadee nests. That's one of their favorites. So if you have a used chickadee nest, you might want to keep an eye out for bumblebees, but I would encourage you don't do anything, don't hurt them. Like I said, there's a yearly cycle, so once the first frost hits, all the bumblebee nests will go away, and they will not go back and use that same site again. They usually try to find a different site. So uh, if you just put up a little fence around it maybe, or something to keep people and pets away, I would encourage just keeping, keeping it there. Um, and that goes for yellow jackets too. So, but all this talk of habitat and building the nest and get it, getting the tubes up and the cavity nesters and all that, I would like to say that if you build it, they will come, but they're not gonna come. They're not gonna come because you don't have the habitat or the food that they need, the nutrition that they need. So if you're gonna ask me, what can I, what's the one thing I can do to help the bees and help pollinators in general? I would say you have to put in a pollinator garden. That's critical because they need the food. That's step one is to make sure that they have the nutrition and the food that they need. So in your pollinator garden, you want to remember to, that these bees have short tongues. A lot of the, the <coughs> some of the native plants have long tubular type flowers, which are great for hummingbirds and butterflies and, and those kind of things, which I encourage. But if you're interested in attracting native bees, you also need to have some flowers that have shorter stamens, uh, like the composites and some of those where the bees can easily get the pollen and the nectar. That's what they like. You also want to do lots of colors. You want to clump those colors together. You want to have a whole area of flowers for them because bees will not go to a place that has one flower. What they're going to look for is they're looking for a place where they can keep going back and forth like that bumblebee and keep getting nectar and pollen from a wide group of flowers. So you want to make sure you clump them together and you want to make sure you have lots of them with lots of colors. And you want to make sure that, like I said, you have different kinds of plants for the generalist, the ones that are, you know, here, here, year round. And you also want to make sure that, you know, that it's that you have them so that they can get to them and and you know make sure that they bloom what I'm trying to say make sure that they bloom for the entire season that the plants that you pick some bloom in March some in June some in July some in August some in September all the way through to October uh, because like I said we do have bees that come out at a certain time for certain flowers we also have bees that are generalists that are here year, you know, for the whole summer. So we want to make sure that we have lots of flowers for the bees for the entire season. And especially July and August, because that's when the bees really struggle because there's not a lot of flowers out there for them to feed on. Uh, so that's, that's a really important, part, important time of the year, right before the goldenrod and the aster start blooming where the bees really struggle. So I would encourage you to plant a lot of flowers during that time. You also want to stay away from colivars. Um, you see the one on the left there is a rose that is a wild rose. And you can see how easy it is for the bee to get in there and get the nectar and get the pollen. 
that's on that flower, that's, that's, a, that's easy for them. But the one that was cultivated and crossbred a, a million times and is a very beautiful rose, but it really doesn't do our pollinators any good. They can't get nectar or pollen out of that. So uh, I, would, I would encourage you to stay away from those kind of flowers if you, if you can. <clears throat> also in your gardens, ground cover is very important. Like I said, you know, it's recommended that we don't use mulch, stay away from mulch. And if you do need then you do need to ground, cover the ground, you know, you don't want bare soil, you use different types of ground covers because the bees can get in that and they can get to the soil and plant and raise their nest and have their young. Um, also, it's extremely important for all the wildlife out there that you don't clean off your garden in the fall when you want to do it. You really want to go out and clean off that garden and make it look nice and make it neat, but that's not good for the wildlife. The birds record, you know, rely on the seeds from the seed pods from the different flowers. The bees rely on that ground cover to go down in there and make their nest. Uh, so there's just a lot of, lot of different wildlife that uses your garden in the wintertime for protection and for to, to, to survive the winter. Uh, so you don't want to clean those gardens off. What you want to do is you want to wait for spring and you want to wait for it to be, you know, 50 degrees for a few days. Uh, that way a lot of those things will be coming out of their, you know, their habitats that they've been staying in for over the winter. And uh, so, you know, it's a little bit easier, a little bit safer then to cut back some of the vegetation. And the vegetation, when you do cut it back, don't cut it back all the way to the ground. You want to leave a foot or so of the stem, the old stem standing. I know it might not look good, but, you know, it's good for the bees because a lot of the bees, what they will do is they will burrow down into that stem, into the pith which is the center of the stem and they will dig that out and that's another cavity for them to raise their young. This year cone flowers, I raised a lot of cone flowers and I never cut them back all the way. This year I noticed really for the first time there were a lot of bees that were using those stems that I left sticking up. They were chewing that center out and putting nests in there. One that's real, one bee that's real common in doing that is the small, uh, small carpenter bee it's called, which is a real tiny bee compared to the big carpenter bee. Uh, but they, they use that a lot and I would encourage you not to cut back those stems all the way. Leave something for the bees. Uh, <clears throat> what else can we do? Well, pesticides, of course. Pesticides are very important. I don't know if we can get away from them, but if we do use them, you want to use them responsibly. You want to make sure that you you uh, don't put them out whenever it's a windy out or you don't want to put them out when there's blooms and the bees are on the blooms. Um, so it's better to do it at night if you can. Put the pesticides out, the insecticides. Also, it's been found that other one, you know, herbicides, you know, they kill the flowers, the, the weeds that are out there that the bees love. But also the fungicides work with some of the pesticides and they actually make it worse for the bees. This was found in honeybees especially, where a lot of the farmers on their seed crop, when they plant their seeds, they use the neonicotinoid insecticides, which we know are a problem for the bees. But they also have on those seeds fungicides so that the seeds are safe while they're in the ground until they can germinate. And the combination of those two things that was found is really bad for the bees. It was worse than just having the neonicotinoids alone. So, if you're going to use the insecticides, you know, make sure you do it safely and responsibly. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, what else I have? also dust. That's the other thing is uh, there's a common insecticide called Seven that's out there. Uh, you don't want to use dust at all. You want to use liquids and have them very localized. The dust, what it does, and it's a problem the bees get into again with the corn and the soybean seeds is that when the farmer plants those seeds and that neonicotinoids on those seeds, it stirs up a lot of dust. And like I said, these bees are statically charged. So those insecticides, that seven and some of the other ones that are powders, will actually cling to the bee. 
and they can take it then back to their nest and, and wreak all kinds of havoc. So it's, it's really not good uh, you know, to use those kinds of insecticides. So use liquids, use it localized, and only use it when you absolutely need it uh, to use them. For the mason bees and leaf cutters and all that, you can buy those bees commercially. Uh, you can go on the web and buy mason bees and bumblebees. I don't, most people don't, right? scientists don't recommend it because when you buy those bees, you're transporting them sometimes all the way across the country, like the mason and leaf cutter bees. And with that, you're transporting diseases. And some of the breed bees you do bring into your yard, they may compete with the native bees that are already there. And we don't want to do that either. So I don't recommend buying bees. I would work with the bees you got. And there's plenty of them here in the state of Ohio. So. Another thing you can do that's very important and it's becoming more and more important as the funds for research gets less and less is to become a citizen scientist. I mentioned in the beginning that in the state of Ohio we're doing the Ohio Bee Survey, which is one of the first surveys that's ever been done in the state of Ohio. The problem we run into is there's maybe 20 different scientists out there that are working on bees in Ohio. You got quite a few down at OSU, some at University of Akron, and other universities here in the state, but there's nowhere near enough people to be able to go out and monitor, look for bees, study bees. So what they've done is they've created a science, citizen science project to actually go out and survey native bees. And that's just started this spring. It is to go on for the next two years, so if you're interested, I would encourage you to go to my references and in there I have ways that you can sign up to become involved in that. The program they're using, which is really cool, is called iNaturalist, which is a program that you can get on your computer or you can have it on your phone. Um, and it's really cool because you can take a picture of a bee, upload it, and a whole bunch of experts in the world, worldwide, will take a look at that picture and ID it for you and they, it's all stored in that database. And that's one of the key programs that the scientists here in Ohio are using to do the bee survey. They're gonna go off of that information, plus what all the volunteers are giving them to hopefully come up with a relatively accurate uh, bee atlas. So it's really important and there's a lot of different programs out there that are citizen science programs. There's ones for birds, for flowers, for bees. And these are super important because, like I said, there's just not enough scientists to go around to be able to do all the work that needs to be done. So I, I highly encourage all of, you, all of you to take part in those programs. If you want more information and you don't want to copy down that ugly URL that I have on there to my reference page, uh, you can email me at daddy underscore g56 at hotmail.com. And I'll be happy to send you the link in that link. Uh, when you click on that link, you'll go to my directory, which is my Google directory. And in there I have this presentation. Plus I have the video that we unfortunately couldn't do with this. But um, so there's a lot of information in there on native plants. And that's the other thing I, I should have mentioned is whenever you do set up your pollinator garden, you definitely want to use native plants. Uh, because those are the ones that have co-evolved over the last hundred million years with our native bees and they seem to do a lot better with native plants than, than with the other plants that you can buy at the uh, nursery. A couple of other references I would highly recommend. <clears throat> if you're really interested in native bees, a fabulous book is this book called The Bees in Your Backyard. And Olivia Carroll is one of the authors of it, and she will be here again this summer or doing virtual training through OSU. She is fantastic, and you will get very good at bees. If you don't want to carry that thing in your backpack as you're out there hiking around the fields and such looking at bees, there are also a couple of references. ODNR has a great pamphlet that they put together on native bees and wasps in the state of Ohio. These are free from ODNR. There's also these little plastic pamphlets that they've come up with that are great to carry in your backpack as you're walking and looking at bees to be able to ID some bees that are out there. 
And there is a gentleman at the University of Delaware who is one of my all-time heroes named Doug Tallamy. And everybody on this should get this book. This is a fabulous book. It is called Nature's Best Hope. And he actually has a plan for how we can get ourselves out of this mess and get back to a more sustainable ecosystem for both people and all of the native other native things that are out there that we rely on to keep us healthy and happy. So I would highly recommend this book. It's a, a very interesting read and he has a lot of great ideas. So with that, I will turn it back over to Olivia and see if we have any questions. All right, everybody. Um, thank you for that talk. That was definitely I know I definitely learned a lot. Um, if you are tuning in for the first time and you're not familiar with my background, um, I grew up in Southern Ohio on a small farm raising goats, chickens, um, and in particular honeybees. And so that was kind of my specialty there. Um, and so learning about this was really interesting because like most people, I am mostly concerned about honeybees and mm -hmm. not native bees. I have you know, become aware of native pollinators, learning about their importance and kind of how honeybees are only a small piece in um, ensuring the importance um, and maintaining a healthy ecosystem. So I definitely want to encourage anybody that's watching right now, please, you know, ask a question in our live chat. Um, let us know what you're thinking, um, what kind of questions you have. Um, but if, you know, while you think of those questions, I'm going to actually ask you a question, Carl. Mm -hmm. um, so a few years ago, I'm sure a lot of people can remember when um, Honey Nut Cheerios passed out those pollinator seed packets with their cereal. Um, and then it ended up becoming an issue that these seed packets were going to places where these plants weren't native. Can you talk about kind of like, like what you <clears> thought <throat> when that happened, um, the consequences of that and things like that? No, I mean, that's, that was, I remember that actually. And it is, that was not a good thing that they did. They thought they were doing a really good thing. And right. it was, they, they, out of the goodness of their heart, they were doing this, but it actually was not a good idea. You, we really need to stick to native plants in our area. Uh, there are a lot of places where you can buy seeds and where you can get native plants locally and those are the things we should be focusing on. The invasives that we get a lot of times from these kind of seed packets and, and that sort of thing that have not been produced and grown here in the state of Ohio, uh, those things can spread, they can take over. A lot of the bees can't get at the nectar and the pollen or Another big problem with a lot of these plants is they don't produce a lot of nectar. So the bees have to work a heck of a lot harder at getting the nectar out of those flowers. And that's just, they don't need that right now with all the other things going on. So definitely not a good idea. In my references, I have a lot of suppliers here in the state of Ohio. And I'm sure if anybody in any other state that's it's on now, will go to their state and you know, they'll find a lot of different seed suppliers and plant suppliers for native plants. And that's really, I would encourage everybody to focus on the native plants and, and their area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question I was kind of wondering about, um, so this live stream is being broadcasted, you know, late June. So let's say I'm watching this video and if you were to recommend one thing for me to do to help pollinators in my area, you know, right now, what would you recommend? I'd rec I'd, I would definitely recommend you go out and dig up your yard. Well, first, first I would recommend buy this book because that's what he's recommending is you go out and dig up a patch of your yard mm -hmm. and put in a pollinator garden. I mean, you could do that really almost any time of the year. Uh, a lot of the seeds you're going to get and a lot of the plants that you can buy, they're not maybe going to bloom the first year, so don't get discouraged. Mm -hmm. A lot of these native plants take one or two years before they get really started and really start blooming. So you need to be patient, but that is the one thing I think the bees need the most. They need the biodiversity, they need the nutrition, and they need the resources to be able to raise their young. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have about five minutes left. I wanted to check in and see if there were anything that you wanted to say that you didn't say earlier. You know, like any last words, kind of words of motivation maybe um, that you would want to say to everyone. Well, again, I keep bringing up Doug's book. Uh, he really does a very nice job of, of enthusiasm. You know, he's very enthusiastic. Sure. And he really does, I think, have a good plan for how we can start 
you know, getting us back on track again to making a healthy environment for all the pollinators and all the birds and the bees and the butterflies and caterpillars and everybody else that is out there that's depending on us. So, you know, I, I really do think it's important that if you pick that book up, you'll see what he's saying and understand what we're doing and how bad it is. Mm -hmm. And just get a good idea of some of the things you could do in your yard to really make a big difference. Yeah. Because it, it's just, go on. <laughs> I could go on forever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, absolutely. I, I, you're definitely bringing up some really important points. And I'm glad that you had like, these um, resources here for us to, you know, go on and learn a little bit more uh, beyond this video. Um, we had someone comment in our live chat, actually. Um, Rebecca wanted everyone to know um, a link to a prairie nursery to find native plants. Um, mm -hmm. They are talking about how they have maps um, that show where each plant is, is native to, down to the county. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's impressive. Um, and yep. a couple other things, like what they're good for, for pollinators, beneficial insects, and so on. So um, definitely, like if you're someone that is watching this video and are looking for a way to get you know, involved in making positive impact after this, definitely check out that link that Rebecca um, has posted um, so you can, you know, start having an impact. Yeah, there's some really fabulous information out there. University of Minnesota has a wildflower directory for native plants, mm -hmm. and that's another good place to go. They have it down to each state, what's native and not native, and yeah. what works for different caterpillars and butterflies. And because a lot of the butterflies, you know, they're very specific to a plant, like the monarch, you know, is very specific to that, that one plant that they have to have. So. There's a lot of good lists, and again, Doug in his book has li those lists as well of what kind of, what insects go with what plants and things like that. So it's a lot of good information out there. Just we're, we're blessed with the internet right. and having a lot of really good information. Yeah, so. absolutely. Thank you so much for like sharing all of your knowledge and time um, here today. I definitely, I learned a lot. Um, if you are you know, still watching, I want to remind everyone that we will be going live again on Thursday. Carl will be there. Another volunteer that we have um, named Al will also be with us. We'll be talking about pollinator products. So that could range from you know, um, wax products, um, propolis, pollen, you know, honey, of course. Um, what kind of other things do you think we'll talk about on Thursday? Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things you can get from honeybees. Like I said, they're one of the most, they're, they're very important agricultural crop here in the United States. But again, like I had mentioned, you know, with the leafcutter bees and the elkid bees, mm -hmm. very important to agriculture for pollination services. Yeah. So honeybees, as well as those bees, are used a lot in, in agriculture to pollinate large fields of you know almonds and alfalfa and things like that so that's another big way that uh, another product you might say from the whole pollinator process so yeah absolutely yeah. um so thank you again i hope to see you all here on thursday if you um missed the beginning make sure you check out the links that are in our description to um, either look at stratford ecological center to donate or to look at the pollinator partnership that established uh, national pollinator week about 13 years ago um, so thank you again, everyone.